Okay, so let's talk about why is there something rather than nothing. An interesting question. Uh, I always plan to do a whole separate lecture on these kinds of topics, but there's never enough time. So let me use Daria's wonderful presentation uh, to comment on this. So this is mostly from you know, a commentary on Sean Carroll's take on the topic, but I think it's, I think it's a pretty good take, uh, one way or another. So anyway, so um, Carroll starts by saying that this, th there's this idea that goes back to Leibniz, that there has to be an explanation to existence, that some kind of necessary being or necessary existence at the root of the universe. It's a bit of an oversimplification, because this idea goes way back, maybe to Parmenides, uh, you could say that it's implicit in philosophers before Parmenides, but at least in the Western tradition, Parmenides has something like this idea. And definitely Aristotle does not like infinite regresses, and uh, Aristotle, well, at least appears to insist that everything should have some kind of a, an explanation. By the way, so this is known, I think, in philosophy as principle of sufficient reason, that for something particular to exist, there needs to be a sufficient reason as to why it exists, right? And so, uh, uh, I mean, it's like, in general, you will remember that the big topic in this course is mechanistic versus teleological worldview, right? And in many ways, this exemplifies a teleological take on the picture. Again, I should remind everybody, and myself included, something I said a moment ago in response to Oleg's question is that Leibniz has two philosophies, presu probably, presumably, apparently, Leibniz has two philosophies. One is more superficial and more uninteresting, and the other one is deeper, uh, more logically bound, and, and maybe much more sophisticated. So whenever I, talk, whenever I say something unsympathetic about Leibniz, I mean the, the superficial Leibniz, which was uh, 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 you know, caricatured as Dr. Pangloss. Anyway, um, among, other, among other places. So anyway, so when we talk about this necessary being, I'm not sure if I should talk about this for, a long, for, for too long, but it's like um, there is this very interesting um, project in philosophy of, again, of trying to find ultimate foundations. And to me, this has forever been associated with uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Specifically, this, again, it's like, I want to say that uh, after Hume, after Nietzsche, after Gödel, we have to understand that human thinking in an important respect is circular and self-referential. Self -referential. We do not have an Archimedean point from which to stand. Our thinking always relies on assumptions. Those assumptions cannot be proven. See, and in some sense, what Leibniz does, quite explicitly referring to An Anselm, quite explicitly referring to Anselm, is to, is, you know, to, to, to meditate on Anselm's so-called ontological proof of God's existence. And I'm, I'm not sure if I want to go into the details of Anselm's ontological proof, but it's, again, what Anselm does, I think, uh, uh, ultimately from sort of Kantian, Hegelian, Heideggerian standpoint, from, let's say, Heideggerian standpoint, right? Uh, Anselm tries to define a concept of thought into existence, to define a concept, a cognitive concept into existence. Basically, uh, uh, Anselm ultimately wants to show that the idea of God includes the property of existence. Mm -hmm. So, which is an another thing to say, a non-existent God for Anselm is a contradiction in terms. So to assert the non-existence of God is a contradiction, says Anselm. And I think, uh, f first of all, I think it is a bad argument, it's a wrong argument in all sorts of ways, and the most important philosopher who's associated with the demolition of this argument is Immanuel Kant, Immanuel Kant. And I think that Kant, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if, if there's a simple, single explanation in Kant as to why Anselm doesn't work. Uh, well, I mean, the Kantian one-liner is that existence is not a predicate. But I feel the kind of the, the spirit behind Kant's objection is that, come on, humans do not have direct access to reality. Our access to reality is mediated by the construction of our mind. Later on, later down the line, this is known as constructivist paradigm in epistemology. I don't just see the world as it really is. My mind also actively constructs the world. And I, since I cannot step outside of my head, I cannot disentangle what is brought to the world by my mind and what, what the world exists in itself. Right? And so basically, I think that uh, Kant could, could agree with Anselm that there, maybe there's a certain feature of our perception of the world such that there's unity to the world at bottom. But we, we can talk about this in terms of our thinking, but not necessarily 
you know, but not necessarily about the world itself. So this is a very important, again, like sometimes this is called the epistemological turn, which is supposed to be associated with Descartes, because like after Descartes, after we have gone through the stage of thinking about human cognition in terms of this evil demon, right? And we, we know that all this could be a dream. There could be an evil demon deceiving us and implanting thoughts in our head. Ever since, you know, Descartes has imagined this idea, uh, uh, ever since then, philosophers don't seem to be entitled to legitimately talk about objects in the outside world. We can only talk about the objects as they appear to us, because we only see the world as it appears to us, not as it exists in itself. So what I'm driving at is that this idea of some kind of a necessary being at the root of all universe maybe is a feature of our thought, but it's not necessarily a feature of reality. So let me, let me put it differently. It's like, again, I think there are all sorts of problems with Anselm's proof, but let me, let me try to state this uh, concisely and clearly. So I think what Anselm says, ultimately, is that there is a principle of unity to all reality. And I want to say that from our limited pers perspective, of limited perspective of our cognition, Yes, it seems to be true. There is a principle of unity to reality. Hmm? Like whenever we uh, uh, make statements which appear to be logically coherent, whenever I talk about tables and chairs and supernova explosions and you know um, loves and tickles and itches and also talk about formulas and standard model of particle physics and Pythagorean theorem, there's a certain sense in which all of these things are part of one world, right? There's a sense in which, in my own head, in my own conceptual schema, all of these notions are part of one world. So I want to say, yes, there's unity to reality. There's unity to reality. But problem number one with Anselm, which is why Anselm is crossed out, problem number one is that I am not sure if it's a feature of reality or if it's a feature of my perception. So is it a feature of reality or feature of perception? Could it be that in some kind of you know, super Heraclitean fashion, reality is actually disjoint, but my mind is not able to perceive the disjoint, the disjointment, the disjoining, right? Or maybe there are aspects of reality which go beyond the observable universe, which I simply cannot comprehend, which would defy this unity. It's like very famously Spinoza talks about how mind and matter, mind and matter are two aspects of nature but two aspects out of the infinity of aspects of nature. So beyond material attributes and mental attributes, there's, all, there's an infinity of similar, similar categories which human mind simply cannot perceive. By the way, I, I'm not sure if I should talk about this now. Spinoza has a very interesting way of talking about how he says that mind and, and matter are two aspects of the same reality. So in many ways, Spinoza would be fine with Turing. He's going to say you can describe uh, uh, the human mind in terms of electrochemistry of the brain, that's a material description. It's, it's an aspect of what human beings are. Or you can describe the human mind in terms of my passions, beliefs, and desires. But I'm describing the same object. Mm? It's, like, it's the same object from two different descriptions, right? So it's like, it's, it's a way, it's an attempt to solve the mind-body problem, right? To say that mind and body are simply two different languages to talk about the same thing. But mind, actually, at bottom, is body because these are two aspects of the same reality, some kind of a monist solution. Anyway, let me go back to Anselm. So the first problem, again, is that you, this unity, we're not sure if it's about reality or about perception. And the second problem, I feel, I feel by far the second biggest problem, and so pet peeve of mine is going to be a uh, sidetrack, but let me, let me talk about this. It's like students ask me you know, about God or about religion, and I told you already, I feel this is such an uninteresting question because there are so many ways of thinking about what divinity or what, 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 what is meant by the word God. To say that you believe in God is to say nothing because it's, it's the same thing as saying I have read a book or I have watched a movie. What kind of movie? Have you seen, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, the latest Hollywood blockbuster or are you talking about, I don't know, um, you know, some kind of silent films at the beginning of cinema. Movies are different, right? And, and definitions of God are similarly very different, right? And so notice if you're talking about a principle Principle of which is at root principle of unity at root at the bottom of reality principle of unity at the bottom of reality at the foundation of reality do you pray to this principle does this principle care about you is this the kind of principle that cares about is this principle conscious mm -hmm. is God on this definition conscious is God on this definition the kind of thing that can care that can care about you is God on this kind of definition something that cares about what food you eat and how you prepare it or whom do you have sex with and in which positions, right? And it's like once you realize that none of these questions can be answered, I think it's like in, in an important sense, it's not clear what Anselm has proven. Maybe he has proven the existence of the universe. 
He has proven the existence of the universe as a concept of human mind. I don't expect anybody you know, like, to drop their pants over the news that Anselm has proven the existence of the universe. Like, it's not particularly controversial. The universe exists. Right? It's not supposed to be some kind of article of faith or revelation or things that people you know, it's like go to hell for believing or not believing in or, 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 or something that people shed human blood right? in religion, wars of religion. What have you proven? The existence of the universe? right? Like the, some kind of unifying principle. It's like uh, it's interesting. Sean Carroll likes to call himself a reality realist. Reality realist. He, uh, Carroll has a wonderfully Hegelian, a very beautiful statement. He says nothing uh, is as real as the universe as a whole. Like the universe as a whole has a certain kind, a certain level of reality in which nothing else really is real, right? So it's like this table, this chair, these markers are, are all maybe aspects which are in some important respect less ontologically real than the reality as a whole, which in an important sense kind of cannot be accurately grasped. You can have more or less useful representations of reality, but it's like, like for example, somebody asked him, like, is Schrodinger equation real? Is the, is the wave function of the universe real? And, and Carroll always answers, uh, maybe the wave function of the universe is a useful way of talking about the universe, but nothing is quite as real as the universe itself. Like, it's in a category of its own. And I, I feel it's a very beautiful thought. And it, it captures something of what Spinoza is saying and something of what Hegel is saying. Uh, Spinoza and Hegel, in this sense, are related because Hegel was a big fan of Spinoza. I, I'm sure Carroll have never read Spinoza or Hegel, but he has uh, arrived at the same conclusion by different means, right? So these, these are the broad metaphysical points. Oh, also, let me, once, while we talk about religion, again, sometimes students ask me uh, whether I have religion or not. And it's like, you know, I find myself in a very strange situation because I teach so many different students. And you know, it's like students from China, Japan, America, uh, Russia, Mongolia. It's like from all over the world I have students, and it's beautiful. And it's like to, to some, you know, like certain formulations are, sound bizarre to certain students, and other formulations sound bizarre to other kinds of students. So it's like, it's like so sociologically, in terms of a dialogue, it's kind of hard to please everyone. But let me try to give you my best answer. I feel that religion is like, like your favorite interpretation of God is like your favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's a difficult question. It's far more difficult. Proving the existence of God, I, I feel, is far more difficult than proving Goldbach's conjecture. We, we haven't made any progress in proving Goldbach's conjecture, right? So, so it's like, and so by the same token, it's like we shouldn't expect a simple answer. Like, I, I don't even understand quantum mechanics very well. Why do you ask me about God? But I do have my favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics, right? And what is my favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics? I have read many books. I have listened to different lectures. And I have sort of my own preferred interpretation. I also know about the alternatives. I have reasons for my own interpretation. But I also understand the limitations. And in an important sense, my interpretation of quantum mechanics is my interpretation of quantum mechanics. Like, it's, it's closest, my favorite is closest to the broy bohm pilot wave theory. But I feel that the details are personal to me. Like, I have my own understanding of what the best thing is like. It's like, it's like, like two people read the same book, and they have different impressions. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, everybody who is consciously thinking about this has their own particular nuances of the solution to the mind-body problem, or their own nuances of the solution to quantum mechanics. And I, see, I feel that's, that's wonderful. That's how intellectual development should work. right? You take a, a course like this, and by the end, having listened to all of these various arguments on different sides, you come to your own special understanding. And I feel that belief in God and religion is exactly the same way. You look at the various traditions. You look at the Rig Veda. You look at the Tao Te Ching. You look at uh, uh, you know, Philo of Alexandria or Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite. You look at uh, Aquinas, Augustine, or my favorite Islamic theologian, Ibn Rushd. It's very interesting. For some reason, I don't have a favorite Christian theologian, but I do have a favorite Islamic theologian, Ibn Rushd. Right? So you look at all these, and you take ideas from various places, and this is your understanding. Tentative, hypothetical understanding that evolves. Right? And then, do you want to attach a label to it? Like, it's like uh, red team or blue team. Like, like, it's not football. You don't have to be on a team necessarily. Like, at the end of the day, it's like, uh, uh, um, like if, if I'm taking a poll and people ask me well, what, what my religion is, I don't know. It's like uh, my religion attaches my name to it. I have my own special way of understanding religion, and I need, a, I, and I need at least 16 lectures to explain it. If you, tr if you ask me to summarize it in one name, that's not going to do it justice. Right? In the same fashion, how to most students, saying that I'm an adherent of the De Broglie Bohm pilot wave theory does not say anything. You know, in, in a similar fashion, I feel that, again, these labels, especially religious labels, are not, not useful. Of course, religion is also a political question. So passions run high. So things I say 
even though it's my best attempt and it's my belief that it's a pedagogical way of approaching it, but it's bound to upset, upset somebody. But that's, that's, that's my best uh, um, approach that I can give. Anyway, anyway, we don't have a lot of time. In fact, we have absolutely no time. Do I want to say anything else? Well, it's like, uh, uh, yeah, let me, so in one minute, let me talk about everything else. So, so, so it's like, we start with this idea of the necessary being and um, all sorts of problems with this idea of creation, whatever. Think about, think about these two, right? Reality versus perception and, you know, is, is your God at the end of the day, the God that you have proven exists, isn't it just synonymous with the word universe? Because again, it's like very interesting questions about first mover, no time. So at some point, I'll record a video about this. Um, so Carol then talks about how very often in today's cosmology, people try to, ex to explain the existence of our patch of observable universe as a part of a larger la landscape of the multiverse. So wonderful uh, quasi-evolutionary approach. It's like evolution, right? You have this. Randomness, which genus, which mm -hmm, in evolution, the biological evolution, randomness generates a genotypic landscape. It generates a landscape of different geno genotypes, and then selection operates on these genotypes. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing mysterious about this, and complexity emerges uh, due to these blind mechanistic principles. So the multiverse is something like cosmic selection, right? So you, you use some kind of random principle, maybe random fluctuations in the quantum fields. These are in vogue these days, but who knows? You can, uh, in, in the Roy Bohm pilot wave theory, they have this so-called thermodynamic equilibrium. It's a different way of generating randomness, right? So you have this landscape, randomness which generates a landscape of the multiverses, and you say that within this uh, uh, multiverse landscape, some patches, some patches of, of space are going to be conducive to life. And this is how you explain away the fine-tuning problem. And it's an interesting approach, and I think it's a very beautiful and a very fruitful paradigm. And I feel it's, it's very much worth paying attention to. And it may be that it explains away certain features of the universe which seem miraculous, like the value, the precise value of the fine structure constant, for example. But at the end of the day, I think Carroll philosophically is completely right in saying that this is half an answer, but this could never be a complete answer. Because for the complete answer, it's it seems that maybe, 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 maybe. And you know, it's like I tend to agree with, with Carol. At the end of the day, it's like human thinking does not have an Archimedean point to stand on. Right? Sometimes we just have to say at bottom, like this is the universe in which we find ourselves in. These are the brute facts we observe. So brute facts at the end of the day are things simply that we observe. And maybe there's simply no explanation for them. And maybe it's not even useful to try to ask for explanations for them. Again, it would take a long time to explain exactly why. But it's like like Carol wants us to ask, it's like if I ask you, why, like, uh, uh, why is this marker red? There are all sorts of answers which may be useful and coherent to the question as, as to why this marker is red. So Carol is asking us to go into this mindset and to ask, maybe to ask why the universe exists at all, why the universe exists at all, does not really have a useful answer or a, even a coherent answer. So maybe the existence of the universe is just a brute fact and we have to deal with it in some kind of philosophical way. It's not necessarily very satisfying, but like, you know, like after Descartes, and especially after David Hume, and most importantly after Immanuel Kant, often this is the position in which we find ourselves in. You know, human mind is limited. I mean, I talk about this is after Descartes, but of course Socrates says, I know that I know nothing. Or as Socrates says more precisely in the Apology, he says, Apollo, through his oracle, says that he is wise, who, like Socrates, understands that human, human knowledge does not account for much. And maybe, maybe gods, if they exist, have direct access to reality, but that's not a level of description accessible to human beings, a certain kind of humility, which is at the root of the philosophical enterprise. OK, unfortunately, we're out of time. So colleagues, if you have any other questions, I'd be more than happy to answer after, you know, during the break. Otherwise, thank you so much, especially to Daria. Stay safe, take care, and I 